uh, praise uh, the Lord. And uh, I'm so glad that uh, the Lord has enabled us to uh, be in his Sabbath and uh, rejoice in his providence. I uh, welcome you to this uh, presentation number six. And uh, that is the two cleansing of the temple. And uh, I'd like to pray as we share in the word of God and pray that uh, the Lord himself will minister unto us and uh, he will uh, give us clarity in the things that we need to learn. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, in your presence, again, we enter with uh, joy and thanksgiving to praise your holy name. And so we pray that uh, our hearts may be recharged by the current of heaven. And Lord, the whole of our being may rejoice in being in your presence. Not part of it are consecrated to any idol worship, but Lord, set apart for thy holy cause. Thank you. And uh, thank you for your love and thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you may minister to us now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. And so uh, it is uh, another opportunity to be able to learn the word of God and uh, to see what uh, he is speaking to us. And uh, I want to believe that uh, we have been blessed by the previous pre presentations. And as even we enter into the cleansing of the sanctuary, which is um, the greatest theme in uh, the time that we are living in, I pray that uh, we may have a saving knowledge of the truth rather than just um, having information. And so I'll enter into the presentation. And uh, We are told that uh, the correct understanding of the ministration in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. Everyone of us may come to a position that they understand the services that are going on in the heavenly sanctuary. In the book of Psalms, it is division. 77, 13, I hope we have our Bibles. And uh, always be confirming what you hear being read. Someone can read something that is not in your Bible or paraphrase something that uh, you have never heard and you start looking for it, ask for reference and you'll never get it. Have your Bible, have your uh, spirit of prophecy, E.G. White Estate, as we learn through. Psalm 77, 13, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary, who is so great a God as our God. Now, there, there is no way you can understand God if you do not step in the sanctuary. You see, sometimes we play ignorance that uh, we will be able to go into the church and hear a preacher preach, or uh, we shall have a minister, or we shall log in into YouTube and listen to these things. But uh, a saving knowledge cannot come from human beings. A saving knowledge will only come from you eating of the bread of life. You know, when children are still young, their mothers chew the food for them. But uh, when they are grown up, you do not find a child, really the mother chewing the food for that child again. They are adults and they are grown up, they are youths. And so we must come from listening to being able to read the word of God and understand it. And yes, God has given gifts to various people to be able to expound in the word of the Lord. But um, I encourage us to be 
having a brand spirit where we shall be able to counter check if these things are so. And so thy ways, O God, is in the sanctuary who is so great a God as our God. And that is why everyone must have a knowledge of the sanctuary and the services that are going on in the heavenly sanctuary. And so as we look at this great theme of the cleansing of the sanctuary, I'm praying that the Lord may speak to us because we are told in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, that the sanctuary shall be cleansed. The sanctuary shall be justified. The sanctuary shall be restored to its original uh, status. That is the cleansing of the sanctuary. And so we must look at the day that you are living in. What is Christ doing in the heavenly sanctuary? And uh, what is the duty of the congregation on this day of atonement? What are we supposed to be doing in the day of atonement? And so the way, O oh God, are in the sanctuary, we are looking at the two cleansings of the temple. Again, in the division of Psalms, 73, the division of Psalm 73, I'll read, truly God is good to Israel, even to such are, are of a clean heart. That's simply those whose hearts are cleansed, cleansed from what? cleanse from every defilement. And so all the chaff that is in the heart must be taken away and then we can be cleansed or we can be clean. But as for me, my feet was almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped for I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bonds in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak uh, wickedly concerning oppression, they speak lawfully, they set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither and waters of a full cup are run out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I'll speak thus, behold, I shall offend against the generation of thy children. And when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Verse 17, the anchor point, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood I their end. If you want to know the end of the righteous, step into the sanctuary. If you want to know the end of the wicked, also step in the sanctuary. If you want to do any reform, enter into the sanctuary. Any reforms outside the sanctuary will never impart any sanctification because it's, it's only when we step in the sanctuary that is when we, we are sanctified. But anything outside the sanctuary will never reproduce the character that is um, fit for heaven. And so we read. Thus, the correct, the correct understanding the, of the ministration of the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith that is counseled to the churches, page 347, paragraph 1. Ministers of the gospel have an inspired warrant for keeping the theme Christ continually before the people and directing the attention of the people to him alone. We must cultivate a spirit of John the Baptist that he may increase and may decrease. Ministers have a work to point people to Jesus Christ. 
You remember in the book of Daniel chapter eight, the little horn not being satisfied to continue in paganism, uh, set up another ministration upon the earth where instead of directing people to Jesus Christ, it directed people to man, man to confess sin to man, man to bow down to men and receive their indulgence, receive their forgiveness and receive their restoration. That uh, they put administration, which is um, administration that was usurping the ministration of Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. And so man must cease pointing uh, other men to himself or other men. Ministers of the gospel have an inspired one for keeping the theme, Christ continually before the people and directing the attention of the people to him alone. This is Christ and his righteousness, page five, paragraph two, by uh, uh, Wagona, E.J. Wagona. When Jesus began his public ministry, he claimed the temple from it is a sacrilegious profanation. And among the last acts of his ministry was the second cleansing of the temple. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 118, paragraph 2. And this is what we are looking for. Or this is our subject study tonight. That there was in every apartment, there is a cleansing of the temple. In every apartment, you go to the courtyard, you go to the holy place, and you go to the most holy place. There are two cleansings in each apartment in the, in the sanctuary. When Christ came upon this earth and uh, John the Baptist was the herald of Jesus Christ preparing the way, we have him only having the 12 as he started his ministry. When he is ending his ministry, we find that uh, in the upper room, we have 120. And then in that 120, you find people start to be added, others apostatized. And by the time he's starting the work in the most holy place, there are about um, uh, 200,000 people. But uh, in that first cleansing of the most holy place, you find that only about 50 people remain. And so we are looking at the end of the day of atonement. And the very question is, for the great day of the Lord has come, for the, the great day of the wrath of God has come, and who shall be able to stand? When the Son of Man come, will he find faith upon the earth? Will he find faith upon the face of the earth? And so in John chapter 2, verses 18 to 20, let us turn there and be able to read this first cleansing. John chapter 2, verses 18 to 20. Uh, the Bible says that uh, then Jesus, then, uh, the, then under the Jewish, this is John chapter 2, verses 18. Then under the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jewish, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and will thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remember that he had said, this unto them, and they believe the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So you get the idea that uh, the cleansing, the, 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 the temple has to do with the body, that uh, the temple has to do with the body. So when we are speaking about the cleansing of the sanctuary, we are actually speaking about the cleansing of the soul temple from every defilement. And uh, as Jesus finished his ministry in 31 AD, he cleanses the, temp the temple uh, a second time. The, uh, the, the cleansing of the temple found in uh, John chapter 2, 
uh, in 27 AD, we read, and the Jewish from verse 13, and the Jewish Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up into Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And he said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house and a house of merchandise. Don't make the house of my father a house of merchandise. And so in the preceding verses, he says that this temple represents his body. And so the, the temple or the cleansing of the temple then will represent the cleansing of uh, the soul temple uh, from every defilement, from every business that is going on in our lives that uh, is preoccupying the place where the worship of Jesus Christ should be going on. And uh, we cannot worship God aright if our minds are defiled, if our bodies are defiled with the cares of this world. Now, as Jesus finishes his ministry in 31 AD, he cleanses the temple a second time, the book of Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 to 16. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold, do sold doves and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be cleansed, called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priest and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David, they were so displeased. Now, um, as soon as the temple was cleansed, actually we find that the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Now, this is so much important because in the book of um, Evangelism, page uh, Evangelism, page 110, I suppose. Paragraph. A uh, uh, paragraph two. Evangelism, page 110, paragraph two. There we read that uh, the Lord does not now work to bring my many souls into the truth because of the church members who have never been converted and those who were once converted but who have backslidden. We are told there is a vast amount of rubbish brought forward by professed believers in Christ which blocks up the way to the cross. Notwithstanding all this, there are some who are so deeply convicted that they will come through every discouragement and will surmount every obstacle in order to gain the truth. But had the believers in the truth purified their minds by obeying it, had they felt the importance of knowledge and refinement, refinement of manners in Christ's work, where one soul has been saved, there might have been, uh, there have been 20. And so immediately you see that temple being cleansed, actually the lame and the blind, they come and be healed. It's, it's a wonderful connection that uh, we are going to get in these places. And this is only in the courtyard when he is cleansing the temple for the first time and the second time that time. In every cleansing of the temple, actually it is followed with uh, a harvest or with uh, a great work because we read that um, in Matthew chapter 21 verse 15, and when the chief priest and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did. So, in this cleansing of the temple, it was followed with very wonderful things. In the second cleansing of the temple, actually it was followed with the, the Jesus Christ riding as a king to go and offer the atoning sacrifice. And then you remember the Greeks coming unto him and him saying, now is the son of man glorified. Uh, you understand that where 
defilement have been taken away, there there is purity. Now, this issue of the blind and the lame being healed after the cleansing of the temple, you remember that he was able to send out the 12 and then the 70 to do a work. And what work was that? The work of medical missionary. Now, I want you to listen to the statement I'm going to make and uh, God willing, maybe we can have a, a full presentation on this. That um, when our soul temple is cleansed, then we shall be able to do the work that Christ has done. And what kind of work did Christ do? You turn to me in the book of Luke, chapter four, and I'm reading verse 18. Luke chapter four, verse 18. I want to connect something so beautiful here in the cleansing of the sanctuary and the medical missionary work. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. This is the work that Christ was able to do when he was on earth. When he cleaned the temple for the first time and the second time, he was able to endure uh, the disciples with the spirit to do the very same work he was able to do and uh, they went about healing and uh, preaching the good news and they came back and reported to Jesus Christ even the devils obey us in the book of uh, Acts chapter 10 verse 38 in the book of Acts chapter 10 verse 8 and uh, this is uh, after the ministration of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, the book of Acts chapter 10, verse 38. We read of what Christ did and what the disciples were doing. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all, the, all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. The very same work that Jesus Christ did after our temple are cleansed, then we are endowed the spirit to do the same. And the work is found in Isaiah chapter 58 and the book of Matthew chapter 25. And so uh, it is the highest uh, gift of healing that uh, Christ endows unto us in medical missionary work. When our soul are cleansed, then we become ministers of uh, glad tidings, both in uh, ministering for physical health and uh, spiritual health. And so we become, we are endowed with the gift of healing in the highest sense, that is medical missionary work, because we are told that uh, the manner in which Christ worked in healing the sick is not the way that he will do it in the end time for Satan will counterfeit these things so much. And so the gift of uh, the, 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 the department or uh, the work of medical missionary is the gift of healing in its highest sense, but it can only happen where the temple has been cleansed and then God can use such a people to do a marvelous work. In Daniel, in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel? We are told that uh, those who come into the sanctuary, they are measured to see if they are living according to the truth that uh, they have received. Christ entered the most holy place in heavenly sanctuary in October 22, 1844 to start the work of investigative judgment or what we call the day of atonement. 
in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 to 3, he says, Behold, I'll send my messenger and shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, said the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like a fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purify of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and pipe them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So what the Lord is seeking in this cleansing is that he may have a people who can offer an offering in righteousness, that um, our offering shall not be defiled. The lamb that came into the sanctuary did not have spot. And we are told in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you, brethren, that uh, by the mercies of God, offer your bodies, your soul tembos as a living sacrifice so that uh, that is the acceptable service to the Lord. We must allow Christ to be able to purge us. He started the investigative uh, judgment. Uh, the, the first in, investigated at the righteous dead in Hebrews 9.27. We find that uh, those cases that appear before the Lord, uh, first starting from the righteous dead, and, uh, and it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this is the judgment. So the ju investigative judgment first starts with the dead, and more so the righteous dead, and then the, we are told that the judgment shall pass unto the wicked. The second investigated at the righteous living, which will, when we are brought into the issue of the mark of the beast, was the seal of God, and you can find that in uh, 60, page 130. And so the first cleansing, also known as entering, going to the marriage, the second cleansing, also known as coming out of the wedding in Luke 12, 36, returning from the wedding. So we are first bought, and then we are brought. And then uh, we have to be cleansed of every unrighteousness so that we may be able to attend the supper, the last supper of the lamb, the marriage supper of um, the lamb. And uh, Christ is cleansing the temple in heaven from the sins of the people, and we must work in harmony with him upon the earth, cleansing the soul temple from its moral defilement. If we will work thus, we shall find that the sweet influence of God's spirit will be wrought into our life. Review and Herald, February 11, 1890, paragraph 4. And so, as the books are opened and um, uh, as the judgment is set and the books are open, we see that uh, the cleansing of the temple in heaven is the cleansing of the sins of the people. And I'll keep repeating that so that uh, repetition may make an impression. And so, in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, we are told, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every, from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I want you to realize one thing there, that uh, we should uh, cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of one, the flesh and the spirit. You know, sometimes people say, God looks at the heart. He doesn't care how you eat. He doesn't care how you wear. He doesn't care how you do other stuff. The Lord looks at the heart. But uh, what a deception that has happened among is the people, that people will just eat anything. They'll go about walking naked. They'll talk anything they want to talk because God looks at the heart. We are told, cleanse the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We cannot say that um, the tree is okay while the fruit it exhibits are not aligning with the profession of the tree. Remember at one time that uh, we had a fig tree in Israel and all that could be seen on the fig tree were leaves and no fruits therein. And when Christ went upon it as if to have something to eat, he found nothing but the leaves. 
And uh, in that instance, he said that never again the tree to bear any fruit and it withered. The next day when Peter wow, was passing with our savior, they saw that the tree had withered and he marveled at it. And so we cannot say that our hearts are right with God. But uh, our lifestyle, when people look at it, actually they don't see that it matches what we are professing. And then uh, you see, we are told that um, the gospel itself shall be preached as a witness and then the end shall come. Now, if you have to preach as a witness, then it means that you have experienced what you are preaching and the fruit therein are being seen. In fact, in the book of John chapter 15, we are told that the tree, the branch that does not produce fruit, then the purge, it is purged away, it's cut away. It doesn't remain on the vine. And so James 4, 8 tells us, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands. That means cleanse everything you do, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. And a double-minded person is unstable in everything. And so we are told, whatsoever our hands find it to do, let us do it with all might. And you know that uh, the commandment says that love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That we are wholly given to Jesus Christ. Nothing is spared. One thing to serve sin and one thing to claim that it is serving God. A question is asked. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Wherewith all shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed there according to thy word. And um, many people and will want to be Christians and at the same time, they will not want to follow what the Bible says. They, they like to be called Christian. They like to attend church. They, they, they like... Uh, identifying themselves with the flock of God. But um, when you point them to the word of God, not in a condemnatory way, not in a condemnation way, but just to show them, my brother or sister, this is what the word of God says in uh, a very humble way. You will hear them say, uh, why are you judging me? Even a very clear thing. You tell somebody that, uh, you know, your outside appearance and uh, how you are behaving is an index of what is in your heart. And then you hear this statement, who has made you a judge? Why are you judging me? All obvious things. And why are they saying that? Because we are told, wherein shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to thy word. And so if they are not comfortable with the, what, the word, uh, what the word of the Lord says, then they, what their essential meaning is that... Uh, they are not being cleansed in any way. And so sometimes we can uh, play courteous and uh, try not to hurt feelings and step on people's toes, but only what we are doing is confirming them in their uh, a denial of the cleansing that is going on in the heavenly sanctuary. Yet when we give out the message, it should be not in a denunciatory way, in a condemnatory way, but in uh, our... Um, in a redemptive way so that uh, people may not give up, people may not see that uh, we are upon them. But, um, you know, when uh, God gave Moses the sanctuary, he told him that build it according to the pattern. He never said that uh, there is some way in the sanctuary you will devise your own way. No, he, he told him build it according to the pattern. Now, if uh, we don't build it according to the pattern, then the Lord's presence cannot come there. We have had people really, you know, we don't talk so much about the dress reform and uh, people walking as they want. They are Christian, but they will want just to dress like they want. They would like to eat the way they want. And uh, when they know that the word of God says that uh, if uh, you would want your mind to be clear, and uh, if you would want the presence of the angels to minister to you, at least take heed to what the word of the Lord says. Now, in the sanctuary, you find that, um, take this point uh, home. 
the inner side of the sanctuary, the temple in the wilderness. In it, there were vessels which were uh, 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 um, which were adorned or um, covered with brass, and uh, there were vessels which were covered with silver, and we have uh, vessels which were covered with uh, pure gold. Amazingly, the candlestick never had anything else, but uh, it was pure beaten gold that made the sanctuary. Interestingly, we are told we are the light of the world. Christ is the light of the world, but he also tells us that we are the light of the world. So both in the in and in the out, because we are part of that uh, candlestick, the branches in the candlestick, you know the very uh, candlestick is Jesus Christ himself being the source of all light, and we are the branches. <laughs> but remember, all even all those branches are made of pure gold which means in the inside and in the outside. But this is the point that uh, the sanctuary inside was adorned so beautifully that um, when Moses, uh, I mean, when Aaron and uh, the priest lighted the candles, you can think how that light shone in the temple. And then it, um, uh, uh, um, it was able to reflect in the coverings that were covering the, the uh, in the top of the, the temple. And uh, <clears throat> in this way, it made uh, something like a rainbow. There we had gold, there we had silver, uh, and we had that table that was made there. And then when you go to the veil itself, it was made of different colors. And then you had the veil that also had different colors and the angels embroidered there. And so when the candles lit, when the, the candlestick lit the sanctuary, actually the brightness that was in the sanctuary was able to make a rainbow somehow. And then this light reflected in a very radiant way. And then the Shekinah glory came and rested on the temple and all Israel were able to see that Shekinah glory. What do I mean? If we cleanse our hearts, the glory that is in the heart will even glow in the outside. The people will be able to understand we have been with Jesus. It will not be a, 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 work, of, uh, uh, a work of pride, a work of uh, uh, exalting self, uh, but it will, be, it will shine out on its own. In fact, we shall not... Uh, claim any wholeness or say that we are without sin, but what is happening inside our hearts will emanate and will be radiant to the whole world. And, uh, you know, we are told in Matthew 5, 14, let your light shine, um, uh, let your light shine and that the people may see your good works and be able to give glory to our heavenly father. So you cannot say that my heart has been cleansed, but your works are the works of uh, a person who is unconverted. We have to understand the cleansing of the sanctuary is the whole changing of the human lifestyle. Not that I may be found with my own righteousness, Philippians 3, 9, but the righteousness which is of faith, the righteousness which is of God, by faith in Jesus Christ. And so this is something that... Uh, it is worthy to explore. We are told again, and I'll clean them from all their iniquity whereby they have sinned against me and I'll pardon all their iniquities whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. Therefore, we ought to confess our sins and leave them before it is forever too late. In 1 John, we are told, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Psalms 51 verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And uh, in our higher calling, page 327, as even I just speed up into the last segment, he, Jesus, is striving to lift them into companionship with himself. It is his work to sanctify his people, to cleanse, ennoble, and purify them, and fill their hearts with peace. He is thus fitting them for glory, honor, and eternal life, for an inheritance richer and more lasting than 
that of any earthly prince. And so as we behold him, we are changed into the self same glory. You know, David says in the book of uh, Psalms 27 verse 4 that one thing have I desired is to dwell in the house of the Lord and to inquire of him and gaze upon his beauty all the days of my life. Why? When Moses went to spend time with God in the Holy Mount, he came there being so bright that even the people of Israel could not look at him. I wonder how we will want to shine if we are not spending much time with the Lord in confession, in reading his word, in communion and relationship with him and his son and holy angels, so that the same glory they have, they may pass unto us and we may shine forth the light that we have received with them. We profess so much to love Jesus Christ, but we spend so little time with them. And so it is uh, a high time that we thought about how do we spend our time? Do we spend in the presence of Jesus? And the psalmist said that in thy presence there is fullness of joy. No wonder many of us do not have joy. Why? Because we don't spend time with Jesus Christ. And that is why we are gloomy every time we are complaining, we are murmuring. Because our soul temple is not being cleansed. And so the reason for the soul temple being cleansed, our higher calling is telling us, is so that we may be given peace. Our hearts may be filled with peace. Why is that our hearts are not filled with peace? It is because our soul temple is not being cleansed. Like Peter and his brethren, we too have been washed in the blood of Christ, yet often through conduct with evil, the heart's purity soil. We must come to Christ for his cleansing grace. How grievous to him is our evil temper, our vanity and pride, yet all our infirmity and defilement we must bring to him. He alone can wash us clean. We are not prepared for communion with him unless cleansed by his efficacy. And uh, you know how he cleanses us? When you turn to the book of uh, John chapter 15, you will see how he cleanses us. The book of John chapter 15. After this series, we shall be having another series about the cleansing. And uh, it will be, uh, I can uh, say that Lord, helping us, we, we shall be blessed because we shall be speaking about the word spirit connection. It will be a series on its own. I, I won't mix it with this one. That is why I have skipped the table of shoe bread. I don't want to speak the table of shoe bread. It will be a whole series and we shall be covering the connection between the word and the spirit. So in this uh, sanctuary series, I won't be presenting the table of shoe bread. It will be covered in another series, a whole series of maybe uh, 12 presentations, just looking at the word and the spirit connection. I'm praying that uh, the Lord will open the Bible to us. And so how are we cleansed? John chapter 15. And uh, look at uh, verse uh, 7, if you are having your Bible. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. And then just backtrack a little bit and read verse 3 now. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So what cleanses us? His word. If we don't love his word, then we are not going to be cleansed. Sanctify them with the truth. Your word is truth. In the promise of the comfort in the book of John chapter 14, there was this issue of uh, Judah, uh, Judas, not Judas Iscariot, asking Jesus Christ, how will you be able to manifest yourself unto us? They were not understanding about his omnipresence or his spiritual presence. And then Judas asked him, how is it shall be that you shall manifest yourself unto us? In John chapter 14, verse 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he is that that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I love, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. In verse twenty-two, Judas saith unto him, Not his chariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, 
If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. How is it that we will want to have an abode with the father and the son without his word? It is impossible, and the vehicle and the uh, word is the vehicle of the spirit. You know that word is the carrier of the spirit. They are one inseparably. I'm not saying that the, the, the word is the spirit, but the word is a carrier of the spirit. In fact, when uh, you just go to um, Ephesians chapter 6, you find that very clearly. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, brothers and sisters. Verse 17, it says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So the spirit doesn't have a sharp point without the word. The sharp point of the spirit is the word. For the spirit never manifests itself without the word of God. To the law and to the testimony, if they not speak according to this word, there is no truth in them. So this spirit that comes to the people and it doesn't carry with it the word of God, you will wonder what kind of spirit it is. For the sharpest point of the spirit is the word of God. We are told, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword. The sword is that part that pierces. And so the sword of the spirit is the word of God. It's so clear that we cannot miss or convert about it. And then you, you turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12, and then you find now when these two are coming in a person, we are told, for the word of God is quick. Now, this word quick, when you go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we are told the second Adam became a quickening spirit. Here in Hebrews 4, 12, for the word of God is quick, just as 1 Corinthians 15 verse uh, 45 tells us, you, you find the same idea that um, it is speaking of the same thing. So this quickening spirit, it is sharpest point is it is word. And the word is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing sand of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a designer of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so this is how God speaks to us. And as we accept this word, then we are told, sanctify them with the truth. Thy word is truth. Um, we are told that um, what do the two cleansings of the temple signify? The first cleansing of the temple was at the beginning of his public ministry. The second cleansing of the temple was almost the last act of a public ministry. These two cleansings of the temple correspond to the two calls of Babylon. The first cleansing of the temple represents the first call out of Babylon in the second angel's message. Babylon is fallen. Babylon is fallen because he has made uh, the world dream of the one of her fornication. And the second cleansing of the temple represents the second call out of Babylon in Revelation chapter 18, verse 1, 2, comes down crying mightily. The angel comes down crying mightily with a loud, uh, strong voice. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Come out of her, my people. And so in the first cleansing in the most holy place, Babylon fell. And then all the churches that did not accept the first angel's message became Babylon. In the second cleansing of the temple, Babylon for the last time falls, and we are told that time Babylon is not converted, come out of her. And we have to come out of every false institution, every false, I mean every false institution, every false institution, and we can be specific about them, but God help us that we will be able to learn as uh, the spirit will lead us. And so, the two cleansings of the temple in the most holy place coincides with the midnight cry and the loud cry. Essentially, that is what it is. And uh, there is uh, last day events, page uh, 179, paragraph two, I presume. Uh, is it uh, last day's event, page 179.2? Yes, where we are told the great issue Sony at hand, the enforcement of Sunday laws will weed out 
those whom God has not appointed and will have a pure, true, sanctified ministry prepared for the latter reign. So no impure woman or man is going to receive the latter reign. The soul temple must be cleansed because the Lord would want to use it. It was only when the temple was cleansed on the day of atonement that the Shekinah glory came and was able to bless the people. The priest was able to come out of the temple and bless the people. Unless our soul temples are cleansed, then the Shekinah glory is not going to fill the temple and then the priest, high priest will not come out to bless his people. And more than this, the first call out of Babylon was certainly at the beginning of his heavenly, heavenly ministry in the most holy place. And as his second cleansing of the temple was almost the last act of his earthly ministry, and as this corresponds to the second call out of Babylon, it is plain that when this call goes forth, when the angel of Revelation 18, 1 and 2 comes down from heaven, we are then certainly in the time of almost the last act of his heavenly ministry in the most holy place. And we are certainly now in the time of the call of the angel of Revelation 18, 1 and 2, the loud cry of the third angel's message, and are just as certainly in the time of almost the last act of our Savior in his heavenly ministry for us. Almost the last act of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary, heavenly temple. Um, almost the last act now, soon the last act itself will come, then probably uh, will be passed. And are you ready? This is um, from uh, this is from uh, Alonso Trevor Jones. That is uh, a uh, 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 in the in the home missionary by uh, Alonzo Trevor Jones, and so again we are told that uh, well the latter end is the loud cry of the third angel's message. It is the beginning of that message of glory that lightens the earth, but the latter rain is the teaching of righteousness. When did that message of righteousness of God as such come to us as a people? That is four years ago, speaking about 1888, and he was talking about in the, uh, in the spring of 1893. Now that message of the righteousness of Christ is the loud cry, is the latter rain. We have been praying for the latter rain here at this conference already, haven't we, have you? The, the, the congregation said uh, yes. What these gifts of nature are to animal and plants such as Christ to those who trust in him, he is their everlasting light, a sun and shield. He shall be at the dew, as the dew unto Israel, he shall come down like rain upon mown grass. May the Lord help his people to claim the soul temple from every defilement and to maintain such a close connection with him that they may be partakers of the latter rain when it shall be poured out and then Habakkuk 2 14 say for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea and after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory now I have a couple of slides and then I, I say something we close our bodies are the temple of God 1 Corinthians 3 16 17 and 6 and 9, 6 19 the Lord is surely coming to his temple, but who may abide the day of his coming? The Jews will not accept his cleansing of the ancient people, of, of the ancient temple. And so instead of standing forever, it had to be destroyed. For if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. And you understand that uh, whoever did not appear uh, before the sanctuary for his sins to be cleansed, he was cut off of Israel. And so... As it were in the first cleansing of the temple, when he entered into the sanctuary, many were cut off and a handful of 50 remained. So shall be in the ending of the cleansing of the sanctuary. Not many will go through this great ordeal. We are told many will uh, fall by the way. God will cleanse us by the coming of his messenger. But if we refuse to be cleansed, then will his coming destroy us. But the power and glory of his coming to destroy is the power of his coming coming to save. The fire that burns up the, up the finally impenitent is the fire that consumes the sins of those who have allowed themselves to be cleansed. This is January 3rd, 
1901, E.J. Wagoner in Presence Truth, uh, United Kingdom, page uh, four, paragraph five. Um, during the loud cry by thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. Great Controversy 6, 12, paragraph one. And then every day, every hour, let me feel thy cleansing power. Blessed is who his transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And he's quoting from uh, the division of Psalms 32, I believe, uh, the division of Psalms 32 in uh, January 3rd, 1901, present truth, United Kingdom, page four, paragraph eight. Now, one thing that, uh, one last uh, statement I want to say is this. Whenever the temple is cleansed, the spirit comes. And what does the spirit come with? I started with this statement that uh, we shall be endowed with the highest gift that heaven can bestow upon humanity. That is the medical missionary gift. But not only that, let us look at Ephesians chapter 4 as we close. Ephesians chapter 4. The Lord is not only cleansing the temple to give us a righteous character, but look at what he is also <clears throat> doing unto us, the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 7 says, but, every, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the mes measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto them. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also. Uh, we read that uh, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So he is filling us with his spirit, not only for the righteous character, but Luke, verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. And for what reason, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so God wants us to be one. That was the prayer of Jesus Christ in John 17 when he was parting. And the only way he can make us one is to fill us with his spirit, not only for the righteous character, but also for the gifts, for the ministry. And so when our soul temple shall be cleansed from every defilement, then we shall be one. Then we shall use our gifts to bring many unto truth, not to fight against each other. Right now you find that uh, it's like people are possessing gifts only to brag about them and to fight each other. One uh, 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 brags about how he understands this and another one brags how he understands that this is not of the Lord. Even the devil can make you understand something. The unity that was prayed in John chapter 17 will be realized when our soul temples are cleansed. And then the Lord will endow us with the gift. In the sounding of the midnight cry and the loud cry, the gifts have to be restored unto us. And I finish with the Matthew chapter 25 in the parable of the, 25, in the parable of 10 virgins. We are told connected to it is the parable of the talents. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And one and unto one he gave five talents to another two and to another one to every man according to his several ability and straight away took his journey and that is what the lord would want to do for us in this cleansing of the temple the question for myself and the question for you are we ready to enter into the ministry 
And if we say yes, then essentially what we are saying, we are ready to be healed and cleansed by Jesus Christ so that we may work for him. May we accept the message from Christ. May we accept his cleansing. However painful it is, nothing ever became good without a work being done on it. We are the clay and he is the potter. Let us accept him to mold us into his own desired vessel and then be set apart for his ministry, even the loud cry that is nigh unto us. Shall we close? with the, a word of prayer. Lord in heaven, we thank you because uh, you are in the business of saving us, Lord. Help us to be a given unto thee, to give a heart unto thee. Even though we are so weak and frail, that today we purpose to give you and another time, Lord, we are drawing away. We pray that uh, you are drawing spirit may draw us unto thee. And so thank you because what is impossible with man, it is uh, possible with thee. And so I believe that uh, you will be able to accord us your own righteousness and equip us for thy holy work, even the end time work, which we know that uh, it's a great work, but a short time. But with thee, Lord, we know that uh, Christ being the captain, we shall be able to fight victoriously this war. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.